Hello Internet, Retro Kevin here. In today's video, I'm going to be refurbishing a Nintendo NES Advantage controller. I'm going to apologize to the peers out there in advance. It's in pretty rough shape, so I will have to do quite a bit of work to it. So let's head over to the workbench and I'll show you what we're dealing with today. And here it is, the Nintendo NES Advantage. Now it may not look too bad, just a little dirty, but it gets worse. Cord's insulation is a little beat up here, but I'm not seeing any broken wires. And someone wrote their name in permanent marker here. But here's the worst of it. It is really rusty and missing a rubber pad. Now let's crack it open and see what other surprises await us in there. For this, there's just six Phillips screws. We'll start with the three that are exposed. And toss those in a bin so we don't lose them. Now let's get those rubber pads off to get those last three screws. For this you can use a flathead screwdriver or anything like that just to get underneath those pads. Once we get those off, we can remove the three remaining screws. Time to remove this bottom plate and get to the good stuff. Okay, normally these come right out. But due to all that rust, it's just stuck in there pretty good. I just kind of broke my tool. Oh well. I'm not prying too hard because I don't want to ruin this plate any more than it already is. Alright, got it. Yeah, that's pretty rusty on the inside too. and the rust is just falling out. Time to continue taking this apart. We'll remove the ball on the joystick by just unscrewing it. And more rust. There's four screws holding that joystick in. These are the only screws that are different from the others. Make sure to have a grip on this. There's a spring under that board that will pop out if you're not careful. That's the joystick. And there's the spring I warned you about. Let's get that cord out of the way so we can finish removing the board. These turbo dials are in there pretty good. I'm not going to be able to remove them by hand. Some vice grips or a pair of pliers will help. Careful not to squeeze too tight. You don't want to ruin those knobs. And I'll check it out to make sure I didn't put any big indents in it. It looks good. Now there's a nut holding those dials down. We'll use a 10 millimeter socket bit to remove these. They should just be finger tight, so no need to break out the ratchet. Once those are out, we can flip the controller back over and remove the rest of the screws. There's a grounding bracket with that screw there. And at this point, I realize I didn't point out all the screw locations were taken out. 
there's the two we already removed. With four more to go. Now the board will come right out. A little dirty, but not too bad. The capacitor there we'll test out later. These are the conductive pads for the buttons. Those are the 10 millimeter nuts from the turbo dials that finally came out. And I was more concerned about the washer remaining on the other side. I completely forgot about the rest of the buttons. Luckily I didn't lose any. Look how dirty the inside of that case is. Uh, let's pick up all the parts so we don't forget about them, or lose them for that matter. The case we'll set aside and clean up later, as we still have four conductive pads to get to. On the bottom of this, there's two clips holding this board together. Again, being careful not to break it, this plastic is around 30 years old. And those pads are kind of stuck to the board, but come off pretty easy. Now we'll set everything off to the side and work on that rusty plate. Safety first. I'll use a wire wheel brush to grind off that rust. This is going to take a bit, so I'll cut to when I get all the edges done. So I got most of the rust on this side. As you might be able to see, the metal is pretty pitted from that rust. I'm going to remove the rest of this paint to make sure there's no hidden rust anywhere. And sure enough, there was a few spots that were starting to rust. Next, we'll clean it off with a little degreaser. And now for the other side. Again, I'll just cut to later to when it's all done. All done. This side has a lot more pitting going on. Again, we'll just clean it up and let it dry before we get to painting. Start off with some self-etching primer. Wait for that to dry and get to the other side. Okay, now that both sides are dry, it's time to get on to our paint. This I'll be using a texture paint that will help hide the pitting.
Now I'll admit, I'm not a painter, so please don't hate me for this horrible paint job I'm doing. While that paint dries, I'm going to be working on cleaning up the case, buttons, and conductive pads. Starting off with the main case, we'll work on getting as much of the inside clean as we can. Alright, time to break out a pan of soapy water. It's not a perfect fit, but it's just a tin pan, so I'll make it fit. Using a toothbrush will get to all those hard to reach areas. and a scrub sponge to try and get some more of that stuck rust. Now that we got most of it cleaned up, let's work on that permanent marker. For that, I'll use a cotton swab and some isopropyl alcohol. bit of work and that marker is all gone. Clean it up a little more with the Clorox wipe. We'll continue to use wipes to clean up the joystick, buttons, and conductive pads. Setting everything off to the side so we know we've done that part already, and so it can dry. I'm going to clean up the nut and washer too from that turbo dial, so it was pretty dirty. Remember that capacitor I talked about earlier? Time to test that. Here we have an in-circuit capacitor tester. Pretty straightforward to use. You may or may not be able to see it, but this capacitor is a 47 UF or microfarad and 16 volts. We don't need to worry about the voltage for the testing. Here's 47 microfarads on the tester. And we'll just test the back posts of the capacitor. And again, I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's a red light on the side of the tester. We'll just trace where the light was showing up over to the 47 UF column, and it was in the yellow. So that means the capacitor is still working, but it is around 30 years old, and capacitors don't last forever. They're a super cheap part, and easy to replace. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that right now. Here's the replacement capacitor. 47 UF and 16 volts. The 
The white strip on the side shows us the polarity of the cap, the stripe being negative. This board is marked with a little plus, letting us know the polarity here. But not all boards will be marked, so we'll look at the old capacitor for that white stripe. You do not want to put a capacitor in backwards. I've never done it myself, but I guess they go off like little firecrackers. Time to desolder that cap. If you're like me and don't have a desoldering station or anything, you can use some flux and a desoldering wire to get the job done. Make sure to clean and retin your soldering iron. Then we'll clean it up with some isopropyl alcohol. Now remember which way to put that cap in. White stripe equals negative. The positive will normally have a longer post on it as well. Again, I don't know if you can see it or not, but this board is marked with the little plus sign to let us know which side is positive. Get that cap in and bend it down so it'll fit inside the case. And bend the post on the other side so it won't fall out. Now I bend the posts away from each other. It's just kind of a habit of mine. And we'll trim off the excess posts. Careful not to scratch the board. Most solder you buy these days has flux in it, but I like to use some on the solder joints just to make sure there's enough. Now we'll carefully solder those joints making sure not to use too much solder. Cleaning it up with some more alcohol and inspecting our work. I'm gonna use some contact cleaner on the other side of the board just to clean it up a little bit and get those old buttons clean from any gunk that might have gotten in there over the years. One button was sticking a little bit so I'll use a little more cleaner. Now using a drafting eraser to clean up the contacts for those conductive pads. Finish with cleaning up with some more alcohol. On to working on that cord. Looking closer, I still don't see any wires that broke, just the insulation. So I think what I'm going to do is just remove that rubber piece and move it down the cord a little bit, hiding the broken part inside the controller.
Looks like we're gonna have to cut it off. Being careful not to cut ourselves or into that already broken cord. Careful again to remove it without ruining it worse than we already have. Then we'll just replace it further down the cord. We'll wrap that cord up with a little bit of electrical tape, just for safe measures. Now we got everything all cleaned up, paint is almost dry, so let's start putting this controller back together. Start by putting the joystick spring back, and the buttons. Trying to remember where they all go, with a little bit of trial and error, and looking at the board, I finally figure out where all the buttons go. We'll put the conductive pads back on the buttons that we'll need them. For the joystick pads, we'll place those into this. That way we make sure that they're in the right spots. With the joystick, you'll see four slits on the bottom of that circle. Those line up with four plastic tabs on the case. Holding that board down so we can get those four screws in. Remember, these are the only screws that are different from the others. Here's that grounding plate that goes on that corner post. Seeing as how all of the screws remaining are all the same, I'm going to pick out the ugly ones to hide inside the controller. Again, showing the six main screws. and the four joystick screws. Putting that cord in will be a little tricky, seeing as how we cut that rubber part. You can see the cut we made, but most people will never notice it. And again, my paint job isn't perfect, but it's a lot better looking than what it was. Yeah, paint's a little tacky. Now we'll get the six remaining screws in for this bottom plate. Flip over the controller to get that joystick ball screwed back on. And the two washers and nuts for those turbo dials. Again, using a 10 millimeter socket bit, we'll get those in finger tight. Turn the dials all the way counterclockwise. And align those dots with that arrow. We're almost done. Seeing as we're missing that one rubber pad for the bottom, and I don't have any replacements on hand, I'm going to use these stick-on felt pads. Now I know between these and the paint job, I probably have some purists hating me right now, but this controller probably will be going to my personal collection, and little stuff like that doesn't bother me. One last step, and I'll call it done. We're going to use some more Clorox wipes and clean up that cord. You'll be surprised how filthy those things can get. See? Look at that. Absolutely disgusting. We'll just continue doing this until the wipe isn't covered in filth. Now that the controller is all cleaned up, it's time to test it and make sure all of this work wasn't for nothing. And what better game to test it out with than Turtles 3.
everything seems to be working great. And this is a great game. I think I'm going to play it for a little while. There we go. We took a rusted out, dirty NES Advantage controller and made it like new again. To the purists out there that are mad at me, I'm sorry, but I just couldn't let a piece of history like this just rust away. This video was a little longer, so thanks to anybody who stuck it out through the end. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you really enjoyed it, please like, comment, and subscribe as it'll help out me and the channel quite a lot. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.